Dr. Rosen, welcome to the Unfiltered Healing Podcast. Dr. Hamill, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm very honored to have you on today. You know, you're not only a pillar in the chiropractic profession, but definitely in the pediatric world as well, since you you and your wife combined have been in practice 80 years, you say. So <laughs> Let's be clear, it's 40 each, though, not 80 each. So that's yeah, great. but combined, that's, yeah, that's a lot combined. of wealth of information. Sometimes, sometimes miss the little nuances, you know. <laughs> um, so we're just honored to have you on today and all of your expertise with you and your wife and all the trainings and teachings that you do for our profession and for the pediatric world. So for our listeners who don't know who you are, uh, would you mind giving a little just introduction about yourself? Would you intro, you know, how you got yeah, kind yeah. of also into the world of pediatrics? Is that something that you thought you would go into right away? Or how did you develop into that niche, so to speak, in your profession? Okay. So um, 1978, I went to chiropractic school. Um, and when I went to chiropractic, I went to a school called Sherman in South Carolina. I met my wife there. Um, she wasn't my wife at that time, obviously, and we got into a relationship and we ended up getting married and we actually transferred and went to a school in Georgia called Life um, Chiropractic College and we got married down there and we had a, we got pregnant and we graduated chiropractic school and my wife Nancy was seven and a half months pregnant and throughout chiropractic school, we were kind of very, we were good students. We studied SOT, we were, you know, we were kind of advocates of the SOT protocols and Major Dujernet. We traveled all over the country to see him and hear him lecture and, and learn from it. So we were very based in technique at that point in time. And we got out of school. We moved up to Massachusetts. And we didn't really know anybody up here, but I had gotten a job. And about one month after working, um, we had a baby. And so we had this little beautiful child that we had, and we had all this chiropractic philosophy about human potential and, you know, the primary subluxation occurring in the first two years of life and how important it was to get your children adjusted and realized we didn't have a skill set. Um, you know, chiropractic school, especially in, in the 70 and 81, did not teach pediatrics. It wasn't a prevalent thing. And even Dijernet, who was the man who I learned from, graduated chiropractic school in 1924, and he wrote a lot of information about how important it was to adjust children in the first seven years of life and not the primary subluxation, but he didn't really have any technique um, that would be applicable. So it was really a matter of learning on the fly. You know, when you have a philosophical construct that says you have this beautiful human being and you want them to function at their optimum potential and be able to adapt to their environment. And that one of the ways to do that is by clearing out their spine and their nervous system and you don't have the skill set, then you either find someone who has it or learn to do it. And I chose, Nancy and I chose the second, which was figure out how to do it. So as my daughter, who will be 40 um, this month, will tell you that she was an experiment in many ways, like the first child usually is, <laughs> but we learned. Um, and in the 90s, I was asked to set up the first pediatric program for a, 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 an organization called Sourcy, which was one of the majors of teaching arms. And so I set up their first pediatric program and never stopped from there. And we have a second daughter who um, is a doctor also, Dr. Erin Rosen, who graduated from life in 2013. So pediatrics became part of our life, just like everybody who out there who knows that once you have a child, life changes, expectations change, goals change. That's what happened to us. We started, we also homeschooled our kids and got involved in a homeschooling community. So we had literally dozens of kids coming into the office. Um, and so I had to learn, I had to kind of raise the bar for myself. And, and that's what we did. And then when I realized that there was such a hole in the chiropractic profession that we had the philosophical constructs of how important it was, but we didn't have the technical skills to do it, or I didn't think we did. And I still think that was true in the eighties and nineties. That was our, that became our motive is to basically teach people to be able to take care of the pediatric population because we realize how important that is to give your child a good start in life. And the best way to do that is to have them have a healthy functional nervous system. So that's kind of the version, short version of my story. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, can you dig into a little bit? Because you talk when you teach uh, a lot of the time, you talk a lot about 
when we look at the health of a person specifically or a child, the first two years of life from zero to two are some of the key pivotal years uh, for that individual. And so you you kind of, you know, emphasize that a lot in your courses and when you teach. So can you expand on that a little bit for listeners to understand why is are those first two years of life so important to, to look at? Sure. So the brain in the first year of life grows 101%. The second year, another 15%. If you look at a cranium or a kid's head, actually, I happen to have one here. So I'll Perfect. just pull this up for a second. With people. When you look at a child's cranium, you see that it's not fused like an adult's cranium. When we look at an adult's cranium, just having to keep my heads around, you have all these sutures. Everything is compressed and contracted. So during these first two years of life, all these little soft spots that you see or what people are going to call fontanelles stay open. And the idea for them the reason they stay open is because the brain has got to grow twice its size, two and a half to three times its size in those first two years. And when I mean grow, it's not just size, it's development pathways. Um, there are two types of matter, gray and white matter in the brain. The white matter is kind of the roadways. The gray matter is what we call the neurons, is the stuff that makes the brain function, basically, and through those pathways. So 80 to 90% of those pathways are laid down in the first two years of life. The third thing that happens in, the, in those two years of life is, is the body or the brain nerves make synapses, connections to each other. And the highest peak potential of when they make those connections is at eight months postnatal. So you're having a brain that's growing, taking in information uh, at a, the most rapid pace it ever will in your entire life and you're laying the foundation. I guess the best way to describe it is if you were building a city. And you wanted to put in the roadways and you put in the power grids and you put in the infrastructure and you put in the buildings for people to live and you built that and then you put people in it and you realize that those people would then start to propagate. And so if you put in a quarter of a million people five years down the road, you might have 1.2 million people. You have to put in an infrastructure to support that. Well, the brain is the same way. We start at baseline neurology. That's why we talk so much about, you know, developmental milestones and primal reflexes, because those are your baseline neurologies. Those are your survival mechanisms. And as they get laid down and as you start to increase those survival mechanisms, you use more and more and more of your brain. So the better ability of your brain to adapt to using more of it, basically more roadways, more pathways, bigger power grid, the better you can adapt. And it's in those first two years of life that almost 80 to 90% of that pathway is laid down. Just like that city, when you first build it, you can always add on to the city, but if the infrastructure is not strong enough to support growth, then as that city grows, the infrastructure tends to break down. And that's what the same thing happens in children's nervous systems. Why we find so often when ch children are three or four years old, they start to get diagnosed with developmental anomalies or developmental challenges. And the truth of the matter is, is those were laid down years before, but the process was missed because someone either didn't have the skill set or didn't pay attention to those neurological glitches. And then at age three or four, when they had to actually interact with their environment in a more functional way, they had problems doing it. And so that's why we feel the first two years of life really set the stage. And it's really important to make sure that all the pathways are clear, all the functionality is there, all the structure is intact or as best as it can be. So that child can have the greatest chance of having or reaching their optimum potential, whatever that may be for that child. Yeah. And when we talk about milestones, when we go into this, so right. this can be kind of like a gray area for people, especially for um, a lot of pediatricians where they will, yeah. and this is not to like put down pediatricians because there's some phenomenal ones, but I've had many patients and I know you have over the years where the pediatrician will say, oh, you know, they're not crawling, which crawling is a milestone. Um, you know, they're going right. to grow out of it or, you know, it's okay, they'll right. walk. And so there's kind of this gray area, like you said, where there's maybe a lack of understanding or education or skill set yeah. to check those things. But we know those milestones are key for the development of that nervous system and brain. So can you, can you expand on uh, these milestones? What, what is a common for us to, to keep track of and what is quote unquote yeah. normal? So developmental milestones are the way the body builds its support system, both neurologically 
structurally and functionally, all three ways. And so their pre-program, what I found so interesting, and I'll address this in a minute, is that the CDC came out with some new milestone changes, which yeah. in my opinion are kind of horrific rate lately, and I'll talk about that. But even in the 90s, I think it was the Neurological, Barrow Neurological Institute in um, Arizona, basically came up with a study that said that all these things that happen to us are pre-programmed in the base of our brainstem, right back here into what's called the cerebellum and the, and the brainstem. And what it means by their pre-programmed is that time to fire off. So at certain points in your life, the milestones are supposed to fire up. So for example, the first month to two months, you should be, the child should be able to lift their head up so they can lay on their tummy, they can look around. From that milestone, they can then develop the ability to turn over from side to side, because that's a very important fact. If the child, can, you got to remember that when children are born, they're in this fight or flight state. They need our help. They have all these defensive mechanisms, one of the primal reflexes, so their survival. But as we get older, we have to then take certain responsibility for our own survival, and that's what the milestones allow us to do. So from from rolling over, the next milestone is we get to be able to sit up. So now we can not only see our environment, we can take in more of it, and that helps to enhance our neurological development. Then from that sitting up point, we get to see that there are other vistas and other horizons that we can explore. So the next thing that has to happen is you have to be able to get there, which is where creeping and crawling come in. Now, creeping and crawling do two things. They allow us to be mobile, but they also make the brain interact. They help coordinate left and right brain functions so that as we get older, um, later on, we can process information better because our brain can communicate. But going from that creeping and crawling, the next step is besides developing muscles, we also help develop and strengthen the normal the secondary curves in our spine so that we're then able to stand. And once we get into a standing position, then we actually become more apt to function in our environment. What's so interesting about the milestones is that by the age of two, which is when about the very, very, very latest, a child should be able to walk and, and, and stand by their own and, and, and focus or in function, all the, miles, all the primal reflexes should be gone, which means there should no longer be a fight or flight response. The child can now be cognizant of their environment and adapt in it. So the milestones build on each other. If you skip a milestone, and, and this is one of the things that they said at the Barrow Institute is we have fault tolerant mechanisms, which means we compensate. We all know that we all compensate for stress in our life. If we miss a milestone, we will compensate for that in some way. So let's say a child skips creeping and crawling and they get to the standing or walking. They will compensate, but what will happen is later on in life, and this is a neurological fact, later on in life, that will decrease a threshold to adapt to certain stresses later. So for example, let's say a child who can't creep or crawl or doesn't and walks, and everybody goes, oh, it looks great. Later on, when they get to school, they may have trouble processing information because their brain hasn't been coordinated, or they have, may have trouble with gross motor movements or fine motor movements because their brain hasn't adapted. So from the outside, it may look, oh, it's okay, or Johnny's not as talented or as coordinated or whatever it is as the next person, because we don't really want to compare our children. But what we do know is that in those cases, what happens is that child is now in a compensatory state, and that lowers their threshold to adapt later in life. So the milestones are so important because they are neurological pinpoints or neurological stepping stones. It's like if you know when you're in the wild, if we you, we see horses and other animals that as soon as they're born, they're able to get up and walk. The reason for that is because if they don't, they will die, right? Yeah. If you leave an animal in the Serengeti desert and can't get up and walk. So if they skip their first milestone, which is walking, they're dead, right? Humans, at least we have, a, we live in enough protective mechanism where someone can help us through that. But if we miss a milestone, what it's telling us is that there is a neurological glitch or a compensatory pattern that we will have to adapt to. So that's why it's so important. And just to quickly back up on the CDC thing. So they put out new milestones. They pushed everything out. Not everything. Pushed a lot of things out like language. Um, the initial milestone said that by age two, we should be able to have, uh, be able to speak 250 words. They dropped it to 50. All right. They said creeping and crawling was no longer a necessary milestone. And the reason for that is they are starting to take what is happening to our children, which are common neurological dysfunctions and accepting them as normal. And that's unacceptable to anybody who wants the future generations to grow. So when you when you find things that are happening. So, for example, the Health and Human Services basically came out two years ago and said that 54 percent of our children have chronic illnesses. And everybody went, oh, okay, that's acceptable. So kids now have asthma, kids have allergies, you know, peanuts become deadly, strawberries can kill you. Um, 
and we're not looking at why that's happening. We're accepting that as norm. I had a patient who is a nurse at a private school in Massachusetts. She had 325 students at the school. The first day of school, 75 EpiPens were delivered to her office, and she expected at least 50 more. So you're talking a third of the kids in her school had such hyperactive immune systems, for whatever the reason is, that they actually had to have EpiPens because certain allergens could kill them. That has never been a factor Mm -mm. before. When I got out of chiropractic school, um, the autism rate was 1 in 2,500. Now it's 1 in 42. So again, the CDC took milestones. And in the last two years, because of the COVID pandemic, you know, we've had kids who have been at home, haven't been able to interact and wearing masks. So of course, their speech has been been, um, affected by that. So instead of saying, wow, we need to fix it, we'll just say, oh, it's okay now. They only need 50 words by age two instead of 250 because we've now taken a situation which has damaged their neurological development and accepting it as normal because it happened so much. And that's what we have to be careful of, that if, because we see things happening a lot doesn't mean that common things are normal. We need to look at why these common aberrant patterns are occurring and what we can do to fix them as opposed to just saying, oh, that's fine. You know, let's just change. Let's change the neurological development of the human that has been there for what? How many centuries? Eons, depending on your belief systems, millions of years, thousands of years, whatever you want to say. But at the very least, it's been there thousands of years and it hasn't shifted because of internal environment. It shifted because of mm-hmm. external factors that we need to look at and we can't just accept them. And, oh, that's fine. It's okay if our kids are dumb or if our kids can't interrelate, if our kids can't function, that's fine with me. That's, that's not personally fine with me. Yeah, it's not fine with me either. And it leaves a lot of confusion for the parents that maybe they yeah. don't feel that that's right, but you know, their pediatrician or someone else right. is telling them that it, that is correct. Right. So, you know, it can be frustrating. And um, additionally, when we talk about, you know, those common things, other than what we've seen transcribed the past couple of years with the mask wearing and all of that stuff, them lowering right. that standard, what are also some other reasons that we're seeing such a decrease in uh, children's ability to develop those milestones? You know, we talk about some of those things, but people may not know that, know those things in particular. Like, you know, we talk about birth and all of those things. So can you expand on that a little bit as well of what, what actually affects those neurologically uh, for those milestones? So... The common cliche is structure affects function. And then people always go, well, does function affect structure, structure affect function. The bottom line is function and structure interrelated. So you went back to the birth process. And I thought that was a good place to start because the birth process can be a traumatic experience. And what's happened over the years is that birth has become much more of a medical intervention than a, than a natural process. Um, in the 60s, the C-section rate was about 6%. Um, now the C-section rate is in some places as high as 38%. So we're having a birth process that's being intervened with. Uh, there's ultrasounds, composite all the time. There is fertility issues that are happening. So the birth process and the uterine process is the basic part of when the developmental um, milestones are set down in a thing called the primary respiratory mechanism. And the short version of that is that Everybody knows we have a spine, which is the bones. Everybody knows we have the cranium, which is the bones. Then we also know we have nerves, which is the spinal cord. Well, there's another system above on top of the nerves called the dermal meningeal system. And if you just think of it as a tube, for those of you who don't, you know, don't understand the anatomy of physiology, it's a tube that attaches all the way down to the tailbone and it comes all the way, attaches into the skull. And then it goes through these little, this hole called the foramen magnum comes into the skull and actually comes through the sutures of the skull forms the endosteum of the, of the cranium and forms little tents inside the cranium that protect the brain. And that tissue does two things. It controls tension on the nervous system and it also controls, controls the movement of what's called cerebral spinal fluid. And cerebral spinal fluid is basically what we call the lifeblood of the central nervous system. Cerebral spinal fluid um, brings nutrients to the brain protects it as a barrier, a chemical and physical barrier, and removes toxins from it, and also helps control temperature of the nervous system. So it has four main functions that keep the nervous system functioning. Your nervous system and your brain creates toxins four to, four to five times a day. The cerebral spinal fluid is changed, exchanged, just like your lymphatic system is. And because your brain, as it functions, cells die and it creates toxins and 
sometimes toxins get into the system. The cerebral spinal fluid takes that out. So what changes that structure is when those attachment points are distorted. So for example, the American Pediatric Association came out with a study that said 47% of children born today have abnormal head shapes. Okay. They have stress in their heads because again, these bones can shift around based on the tension that's attached to the mechanism. And also depending on the birth, when you come down the birth canal normally and the head is compressed during contractions, the whole idea of these suture system is allow the cranium to compress so that it can come out of the birth canal. And then when the first seven to 10 days after it comes out of the birth canal, the head is supposed to expand back into a normal position. Mm -hmm. If the birth was traumatic, um, if there are assisted deliveries, forceps, vacuum deliveries, even things like pitocin, if it was too fast, come down the, I mean, there's a whole plethora of issues that can cause this cranium to distort. And if it distorts and it puts abnormal pressure on it, it changes the tension inside the dural system. If you think of it as a tent, if the spinal cord is a tent pole, and then these are the tents here, when the spinal cord or the cranium gets twisted, like if you're in a tent, the tent guide wires will get tapped torqued or torqued and that tension will create an, the way that dural laryngeal system can function as well. So going back to the American Pediatric Association, they say 47% of children are born with head distortion. Now the problem again, this is that common versus normal issue is that they say only 10% of those kids need to be treated. And the truth of the matter is if you have a distortion, even minor distortions in your spine or cranium, it affects the nervous system. Think of your nervous system as a finely tuned instrument and the dural meningeal system are the strings that attach to it. So if you have a guitar and you have guitar strings and you turn the tuning fork too tight or too loose, you change the tone of that, that um, string, right? Well, the same thing happens to the dural meningeal system. If the tuning fork, the head or the tailbone, let's say, are twisted too much or torqued or stressed from the birth, those dural tissues are too, either too tight or too loose and they change the tone. When you change the tone, just like in an instrument, it doesn't sound as well. It doesn't work as well. And that same thing happens to the nervous system. There are two ways that nerves can get damaged. One is by being compressed, which is what people always think about chiropractic, you know, pinch nerves and stuff like that. But more often in the pediatric practice, what actually happens to the nerves is they get traction and tractioning on the nerve will cause just as much or can cause just as much damage. So now you have a nervous system that's either too tight or too loose. And the second thing that's affected is cerebral spinal fluid. And if cerebral spinal fluid doesn't move correctly, that can cause brain to be damaged. Matter of fact, there has been a study that was done. There was two of them, one in 2013 and one in 2015. And what the study said is that children who had increased levels of cerebral spinal fluid in their cranium, in the ventricles, which are the areas that hold a lot of the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain, between the first six to 24 months, there is a 70% chance that they will develop more of, uh, more of a 70% chance that they will develop neurological issues, including autism before their age of two. So with the first six months of life, they were doing MRIs and they saw that these kids who had too much cerebral spinal fluid, basically too much pressure, had a higher propensity up to 70% of creating neurological dysfunction. So you can see how important that system is to be working correctly. So birth traumas, um, just life adaption traumas. Those, and when I say birth traumas, you know, it can be a, a good birth. And occasionally when that happens, the baby can get twisted or torqued or something. And so it's really important to have your child checked by somebody who knows what they're looking for, you know, as opposed to saying, oh, you know, it's fine. Your child's head looks funny. We'll see if it grows, you know, better. Or don't worry, this, you know, this spine's a little crooked. We'll see what happens. Waiting and seeing in those first two years, as we just talked about, is probably the worst time to wait and see because that's the time the nervous system is developing its fastest. So, yeah, so those are the kind of things that we look at, you know, function and structure interrelate. And we want to make sure that structure and function, the integrity between the two is balanced, but that gives the nervous system the best chance to develop. Yeah, and this is this is important because we we get a lot of people ask us questions. Well, why would I take my child in to get care? You know, right. I think we're getting more understanding as far as at least like if there's an abnormal shape of the head, the parent will say, "Oh, you know, right. something's not right." So, at least there's some right. understanding there of people are finding that and and intuitively knowing like, "Hey, 
does it seem like it should yeah. be right? So I think there's some yeah. stuff with that, but um, this is the biggest reason why we treat children is because of what you just explained. And I think for our profession, which you've mentioned before as well, um, we have now a huge responsibility to check these things in our pediatric patients because, like you said, they're not really getting checked um, or not. properly. Yeah. So there's a huge responsibility for more of us to learn the pediatric population and to uh, look at these milestones and to look at the, the integrity of their nervous system. And that is really why we treat the pediatric population, um, right. we emphasize it, right? Is well, there- yeah. So there's two things, that... I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead, sorry. go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> finish your question. Um, I was done, you can, you can finish yours because I was gonna go into another question. Okay, so I was just gonna say, so yeah, there's two things to look at. So people bring their children to pediatricians to get their checkups, you know, at, mm -hmm. at different times. But, and, I, and then when people bring them to my office, let's say, because that's what I do, pediatric chiropractic, they go, well, my pediatrician didn't check that. Well, my pediatrician didn't say that. And just as you said earlier, it's not that the pediatrician is bad or wrong. It's a different paradigm. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, things I'm not going to check. I'm not going to do a heel stab and a fetal, you know, a PKU test on the child because that's not my job to find yeah. that out. But my job is to check yeah. the nervous system. So the pediatrician it's not that they're bad or wrong. It's just not, it's a different paradigm and it literally is apples and oranges. So what we try and train people to understand is why should I bring my kid to a pediatric chiropractor? Well, does your kid have a spine, a nervous system and a cranium? If they have those three things, then just get them checked. If there's nothing wrong, then great. If there's something that needs to be addressed and we can, in the pediatric practice, we can address it before it becomes a pattern. You know, it's different when a 40 year old who's never been under chiropractic here comes in and they have levels of compensation in their spine years and years and years and years and years. Uh, but when you have a baby that's two months old, three months old, three days old, whatever it is, the process is much shorter. Um, it's much more effective in some ways. Um, and in my world, it's much more important to set up that foundation. So, yeah. So I think that is number one is reframe that. It's like when people go to a dentist, right? When you go to a dentist, people who go to their dentist, get their teeth clean. They go some three months, every six months, whatever it is you go, you go there, not because you have a problem. You go there to get, they check you and they clean your teeth. And are you happy when the dentist comes in and says, wow, you're doing a great job. You know, teeth look good. See you in six months. Or would you rather the dentist say, wow, you know, we need to do a gum scaling. Um, you're going to have to pull this other tooth. You need, you know, you need a root canal. It's like, no, because we don't want to wait till there's a problem. We want to hit it off before there's a problem. So getting your child checked, just like you do in every other venue of your life by a pediatric chiropractor is important to maintain the integrity of how their spine functions. I have, I have a little story that I think would be appropriate there. Um, a number of years ago, this woman came to see us. She was visiting her mom. She lived in California and she was visiting her mom in the town where I work in Wellesley and her daughter was 11 years old. And she knew her daughter had some issues, but um, she wasn't really sure. And, and yeah, she brought her in, we evaluated her. When she came back after I did the exam, after I do an exam in my office, I had the patient come back after I correlate the findings for a re what we call a report of findings. And I started telling the mom, what I found in her daughter neurologically. Now the kid was a sweet kid. You know, she looked pretty normal, most people. And the mom started crying. Mm -hmm. She started literally crying. And I was like, wow, what did I say? You know, and she, when she composed it, she said, I've been telling people for the last 10 years that there's something wrong with my daughter. I have two other kids. I'm not a crazy mom. I said, there's something wrong. And I brought in a pediatrician after pediatrician in California. And they kept telling me she's fine. She'll be fine. She'll outgrow it. She's fine. She's now 11 years old and she's having some issues at school and she's having some social issues. And I know it happened. And, and she goes, I just, I'm just so thankful that somebody actually finally acknowledged what I saw and can now help me. I can make the steps. So moms out there, if you feel something, if you think something is wrong, find somebody who will at least, I'm not saying who find what you find, but at least you can, you can um, communicate what you find and they have the ability to, or the skill set to at least be able to evaluate properly those neurological functions because you're probably correct in what you're seeing. Yes. Mama bears always know. 
<laughs> I do. They know their kids better than anyone, you know. So disregarding their their opinion or what they're thinking they're, is just crazy. They're part of them, mm -hmm. you know. When you're a mother and you've birthed a child, your cells and their cells are the they're the same cells. Yeah, you know, it's. I mean, you know them intimately. Uh, anyhow, yeah. what, what was your next question? Then, right? <laughs> that was great. I loved it. So my next question was, other than birth and birth trauma, which we'll get into in a little bit of how, you know, we would then address and what people should look for to help with that stuff. Um, other than just the birth and the birth process, which is definitely the most, you know, uh, prominent way that right. the, the nervous system can get hindered and in, in, um, the milestones can get compromised. Are there some other ways that that child's nervous system can also be uh, developmentally challenged other than that? Sure. So in the chiropractic paradigm, we talk about several things that affect the nervous system as developed. We talk about the physical, mm -hmm. we talk about structural, we talk about the chemical, we talk about the emotional, and mm -hmm. we even talk about the spiritual. Mm -hmm. So any thing that you have to process through your nervous system, which is, which is anything that's in your life can become a stressor. Now, not all stressors are bad. Some stressors help build the nervous system, right? Some stresses make us stronger. You know, that, that's that old cliche. If it doesn't kill us, it'll make us stronger. That's not always true, but the bottom line is, so if you're have a child that has is toxic environment, um, nutritionally the toxicity, all that stuff the body has to compensate for. So for example, an allergy, what's, what is an allergy? An allergy is not a system that's not functioning low. It's functioning too high. In other words, an allergy is a hyperactive immune system. And what can cause that is if the body is toxic, if it can't discharge its toxicity through the lymphatic system, the central nervous system, it starts overreacting to proteins that most of us don't react to. And so when that protein, which is what a food source is, when that protein enters the system, the body attacks it in a way that it shouldn't because it's so overloaded, it doesn't have a threshold anymore. So one of the major things that we see that cause subluxations, and we call them a viscerosomatic reflexes. And basically there's an overload toxicity in the system in one of the organs. It could be the kidneys, it could be the liver, it could be the gallbladder, it could be the pancreas, it could be the whole digestive system. That system gets overloaded and it creates a reflex back into the spine and that becomes a cyclical what we call subluxation or a cyclical imbalance that keeps firing off so chemical toxicity is is it um a common one it can be from the food they're eating it could be from their environment in a toxic environment okay that's the other thing emotional stresses okay we all know that if you're in an emotionally stressful situation or an abusive situation how that affects your nervous system right? Okay. It becomes hypersensitive. I always explain to people, I said, look, if you're in an emotionally stressful system, let's say that we go to school together. And every time I see you in the hall for the first two weeks, I walk over and punch you in the stomach. Okay. And then I walk by. And so for two weeks, I do this every day. I see you, I punch you in the stomach. Then the third week, I decide, you know what? I'm not going to punch you in the stomach. But as we're walking down the hall and we get near each other, your body is going to react as if I'm going to punch you in the stomach, right? It's been trained for that. So if you're in a stressful emotional environment or stressful situation, that's how your body continues to react. And if you lay that pattern down in early childhood, that baby will react to those situations. It's a common, so there are people sometimes who are afraid of dogs, right? They're adults and they're 20, 30, whatever it is, and they're petrified of dogs. And what you find out is that when they were three or four years old, they got bitten by a dog, right? Mm -hmm. And nothing has happened in the next 15, 20 years. But that has so imprinted their nervous system that that's how they react to life. So those create structural patterns. It's kind of like a PTSD syndrome, right? It's those happen. So the emotional things, the physical things, obviously structural things are babies fall. Babies, when they learn to walk, they fall down, they fall down stairs, they fall on coffee tables. Um, my daughter, when she was, how old was she? I think she was 18 months old. Back way back in the day when we had big TVs, we had a Sony Trinitron on a, on a cabinet on, on a table and she pulled it down on top of herself, you know? Um, so there are those, yeah, yeah, exactly. There are those physical traumas that happen. It's fall kids. I've had mothers come in. I had a mother once came in. She was walking down the stairs with her four month old in a nightgown and she stepped on the edge of the nightgown and she tripped and she fell forward and she 
she projected the baby or projected the baby down the stairs because she lost her balance. And it was just so there are those those physical traumas, even just learning to walk and crawl. You see, if the kids have siblings, right? And the siblings tend to get jealous and they do things. I have a woman, she came in, she said when she was a little kid, her, her older brother was about six or seven years older than her. And um, her mom went next door and left her with the older brother just to watch her. I think he was 11 and she was like four or five. When the mom came in, her older brother was trying to stuff her down the toilet bowl. So <laughs> that was her first trauma. By the way, she does not talk to her brother anymore, I've been told. But anyhow, but so, the, I mean, I mean, obviously that's kind of, you know, not a normal, but just talking about those kind of things. So we have physical traumas, we have chemical traumas, we have emotional yeah. traumas, and then, you know, all those things create patterns that the nervous system locks in. The beauty of the nervous system is that 95 or 90% of the things that happen to us, we adapt to normally. Otherwise, we'd be dead by the time we're two years old. But there is a five or ten percent point class where the threshold is too high and the body can't adapt and it creates a compensatory pattern. So we as chiropractors, especially pediatric chiropractors, learn to determine where those compensatory patterns have been locked in and help to release those compensatory patterns. Because as we get older, the more compensations we have, the harder it is for our body to function normally. Yeah, in addition to coming coming into the structure part for a minute as well, for infants that um, also maybe were not breastfed or didn't get right. some of those, you know, neurological connections there, does that also right. affect how their brain develops? So you're you're crossing a slippery slope for man to go down <laughs> because <laughs> yes, breastfeeding is through most studies the best way to nurture infant, especially for at least the first six months. But there are mm -hmm. a lot of situations where that cannot or does not happen. So for those of you who are listening to it and it didn't happen for you, it's not, yeah. you shouldn't feel guilty about it. We all yeah. as parents do whatever we can do as best as we possibly, but yes. So if a child is not nursing and they're not, and the parent is having a hard time finding a formula they can adapt to, mm -hmm. that can be a stressful pattern. One of the things mm -hmm. that happens with some type of milk formulas is that the protein curd in milk is about seven times the size of human protein curd. So it's hard for kids to digest. Some kids have problems with soy. So it is more difficult when you're dealing with um, formulas to find one that is the most easily adaptable for your child. And if you can't, obviously we'll get, you know, one of the most common things that we see in our practice and probably you see, and that actually is one of the most common pediatric issues is um, reflux or colic, mm -hmm. which is a digestive mm -hmm. issue. I think it was mm -hmm. two years ago, the number one drug the medical profession um, prescribed for infants was Prilosec and Zantac because all these kids were having issues. Right. So we, as chiropractors, we want to find out the cause of that issue. Um, so you're right. The other thing about nursing or sucking correctly is it helps develop the cranium normally. Um, we're talking about things like tongue tie issues. So when kids have issues where they can't suck, nurse normally they don't develop the proper jaw mechanics and they don't develop the proper cranial mechanics and that can often affect them later on in life so again making sure that there's a, a proper ability for them to suck whether it be nursing or on a bottle or pacify or whatever it is making sure that the food that they're able to take in is not causing their body stress trying to digest it you know things like reflux and colic and all that are basically issues with um, part of the parasympathetic nervous system, digestive system. So we want to be able to make sure that that happens. So yeah, those are all, there is not, I mean, the bottom line, there's not a factor that doesn't affect your child's development. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's an intense responsibility. Um, and it's an intense relationship. It's like, you know, I always, with my wife and I always talk to each other about the fact that when we went to chiropractic school, like we were type A personalities, you know, we were kind of the two top students in our classes and a lot of time, you know, we both graduated soon with cum laude and we, we had this vision of going out and practicing and, and, and saving the world and doing all this stuff. And then she got pregnant, had a baby, tried to go back to work and went, I can't do this. And she ended up waiting seven years before she went back to actually practicing full time. And she came from a working family. Her mom had five kids and was a working mom. You know, she had that. And we like, your life changes. I had no idea that I was going to be, 
like a crazy workaholic figuring that I had to provide for my family. And, and at the same time, we did all this stuff to, you know, support our children's neurological development outside of the workplace. So it's, you don't know what's going to happen when you have a kid and, and it changes your view of the world and it changes who you are, you know? Yeah. So, right. So it's an awesome responsibility and right. There are a lot of factors and we all need to be able to do the best we can. We just have to be careful about not blowing off everything. You know what I mean? Like everything is not normal. Everything is not okay. Um, we really want to be able to have some way, which is one of the reasons actually Nancy and I wrote this book. It's all in your head. Um, we just wrote a, a new book for, for, um, the lay per, pay population. It's called all in your head. And it basically explains what is common, what is normal, goes over milestones, goes over primal reflexes, tells parents what to look for. talks about functioning distortion. And we did that because it's the first lay book I ever wrote. All the other books I've ever written were for the profession. And my wife said, you know, we really need to get, because we're seeing our practice people to understand what we're talking about. So that's exactly why we wrote the book. And that's exactly the topics we're talking about is it covers what are the stresses that occur, what should be addressed, what stresses need to be taken care of, and what are things that just show that your baby's adapting to the nervous system. You know, a perfect example of that is I have a mom came in, um, yesterday in the office and uh she said her, her little boy she goes he's you know he was sleeping so great he was doing so great now he's not sleeping as well and i said okay i said is there anything else going on yeah he's starting to crawl i said well okay i said that's great she goes why i said because every certain three to four months your baby in the first two years of life goes through neurological shifts and when they're going through those neurological shifts it changes their whole nervous system pattern so I said, give him some time. As his crawling gets more integrated, I will guarantee you that his sleeping pattern will start to change. But right now, it's like if you get excited about something, like if Rachel, you just like take on a new business, something you're really excited about it, and then you try and go to sleep at night, your brain's just going and going and going. Think, oh, I got to do this. I can do this. I want to do that. Well, the kids' nervous systems do the same thing in little vignettes of time. So I said to her, I said, there's nothing wrong with him, you know, waking up now. What he's doing, it's a neurological change his nervous system is progressing let's just give it you know a, a week or two and you'll see the changes and i'm sure it'll be fine and i'll see him next week and i'll talk to her but i've done this for 40 years thousands and thousands of babies and i see it all the time yeah i see it too and that's what they talk a lot about with infants as far as just feeding like when they have times where they're just feeding a lot more than than normal and they're exactly. up all night all night so it's just changes in the in their needs and their nervous system right. and all of those things right yeah, yeah well don't we do that i mean don't you there are times when i'm you know i'm voraciously eating stuff and there's times that i'm out on x i mean it's it's the how the system and I, you know, I have this patient um her and her husband they're very I, matter of fact i adjusted her at her house the day she was born and now she's has her own kids. She has two of them just to show you how old I really am. But anyhow, when her, her and her husband, when they had their first kid, they did an Excel spreadsheet and they put out all these little checkpoints of how they wanted the kid to do this and how much they pooped and how much they peed. And they were just, cause they were computer people. And, and so about six months into it, she came and I said, I said, Jane, how's that spreadsheet working out? And she was like, <laughs> you threw it out a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Had the best intentions. <laughs> best intentions. You know, they're just going to computerize this kid's spreadsheet. They're going to poop on this day. They're going to pee on this day. They're going to sleep on this day. They're going to eat this much. And yeah, <laughs> no one told the kid that. I think that was the problem. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. And, and for those listening, his new book is excellent. I have it in my office. And not only for children, which is excellent for parents to know, and to give that for a resource, but I've actually had like a, a lot of my adult patients grab it and they start looking at it and then they'll bring it into the treatment room and they'll be like, Hey, my, my cranial nerve here, or, or, right. you know, right. here. And I'm like, yeah, you know, so I can explain it further. So it is really, you know, a wonderful uh, book to right. have to explain some of these concepts that may be for some people a little over your head. Uh, so that's a great sure. resource to have to help simplify those things and to help get more understanding about the topics that we're talking about today. Uh, and, and I then will, I will apologize. Go ahead. I was just, I was just going to apologize to all those 
parents whose grandparents have taken the book out of my office and then came home and hassled them about what they should do about their grandkids. So I'll apologize for that one right now. But I think that happens in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it does. I just didn't want to add another layer to that. But I think we did, but it's okay. That's amazing. Um, so mm -hmm. as we talked about thus far, you know, the things that that parents should be looking out for the reasons that we treat kids the reason that we see things you know um because i've had people come in too that have maybe taken their child to other chiropractors and things of that nature and they're still you know not necessarily getting the results that that they're expecting so i think it's also important to mention for people if you know they are taking them to a professional first of all where should they find them and then secondly, okay. you know, if maybe they're not getting the results where to look for more help and navigate that. Right. So there are a number of organizations that actually train pediatric chiropractors. I would say about a third of the referrals that we get into office for pediatric are from other chiropractors or people who are seeing other chiropractors. So in the chiropractic profession, just like every other profession, there are different skill sets and different paradigms. Like there are sports chiropractors, right? There are chiropractors that just deal with adults. There are chiropractors that just deal with pediatric. There are chiropractors that deal with pregnant moms. There's a whole gamut of it. So there are also chiropractors that stop at the spine. They don't adjust anything but the spine. Um, so what we do and what we train people to is how to adjust the spine, but then how to take the next step and how to adjust the cranium. And that is a different skill set that not every chiropractor has. So if you're going to a chiropractor who maybe your child, you're working with your child and they're doing well and they reach a plateau, it's not because your chiropractor is not skilled at what they do, but if they're not addressing the cranium, which is where 80% of the central nervous system is located, then you may want to ask them, which is what we get a lot of referrals of, of chiropractors who don't address the cranium. We will start working with the cranium. And very often we can then send the patient back to go there to their regular chiropractor because some of them travel very far to see us and it's much easier to see someone locally. And I will only check them periodically. So that's one way that that works. Um, also ask your chiropractor. You can ask your chiropractor, you know, Johnny doesn't seem to be doing well. You know, you think there's something else we can do. There's no, there's no shame in having to refer someone out. I will, I will refer people out if sometimes the technique I'm doing is ineffective. So if you go to a medical doctor and they give you amoxicillin and that doesn't work and you're getting sicker, they're not going to keep giving you amoxicillin. They will change the treatment protocol. Maybe they'll give you um, another antibiotic, you know, and so, or another drug, whatever it is. So in the medical profession, people are very used to like, if the treatment doesn't work, try another treatment. In chiropractic, what tends to happen is people tend to sometimes write off the whole profession if it's not working. And that's not the case. The case is, is that there are different techniques, there are different skill levels, and there are different ways to address the nervous system. So you can talk to your chiropractor that you're seeing right then. The other place is if you want to go on our website, um, it's Dr. Martin Rosen dot com dr martin rosen dot com we have a place where it says our graduates so we have a whole pediatric certificate program and if you go on that list there are people who've taken our entire program graduates they then you'll know that they have learned spinal and cranial adjusting that's one place there's another place called the icpa and that's the icpa for kids.org they have a training program um, you can look on those places for that. The ICA, which is another a group that has a pediatric program. So anybody who has a pediatric program, but the two things you want to look for in my vision or my world is someone who not only has learned spinal adjusting, but also if they've learned cranial adjusting. Now I want you to, I want people to be careful because a lot of people think cranial adjusting is cranial sacral therapy. That's a whole different protocol. That's an osteopathic treatment protocol. I'm not saying it's bad. It's actually, there's very good practitioners in that field. The problem with cranial psychotherapy is you do not have to be an actual healthcare provider, a licensed provider to learn it. So you could take a weekend seminar and say you do CST or cranial psychotherapy. If you go to a chiropractor who does cranial adjusting, you know, at the very least, they have almost 44 years of training as a, as a professional in the chiropractic world. So it's a very different um, prototype and it's a very different paradigm. So those are three places that you can look for. Um, and you can also ask if you're looking for a pediatric chiropractor, you call the office, say, hi, this is, I'm looking for a pediatric chiropractor. Does Dr. John do pediatric? He goes, yes, he does a lot of pediatrics. Does he also do cranial adjusting? Um, you could say yes or no. Not every pediatric chiropractor does cranial adjusting, but it's at least a start. 
and they could also help you move through that process. But again, if you have a child that you think there is a structural issue that's affecting their nervous system and you're not getting results in one place, then look someplace else. I mean, look, you know, look for another chiropractor, look at the places that I suggested for you, Google it, find somebody because there are people out there that have different skill sets that can help you very often when one place has not been able to help you. Yes, you took the questions right out of my mouth. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for explaining all those because those are common, you know, questions that people call in for all of the time. And they're like, oh, you know, I had craniosacral exactly. it didn't necessarily address all of the things that that needed to be addressed. Um, so that was exactly. an excellent recap of how people can can find the appropriate care. And I've also used um, I've also used some PTs even for for little ones because they oh, have yeah. some great you know, help for parents as we're changing the neurological circuits, they can also help make those stay. So there are complementary things to what we can utilize and refer to one another as well. It's not just us, but we do have to take those primary patterns out for those to stick and to stay. But there's some good- yeah, that's, a, that's a great point, Rachel. Yeah. That's a great point. We refer to OTs and PTs because in my office, I don't have the time or actually really the skill set to do whole neurological um, functional workshop and work on uh, work with the patient. So what I've always seen, whether it's a PT or an OT or anybody who does body work is a bunch of other people, is that when the person gets under chiropractic care, even speech therapy, when they get under chiropractic care, the therapist will always report to them and say, I don't know what you're doing differently, but now that the child is under the chiropractic care, they are making changes like leaps and bounds, like so much faster. I had one, one OT say that, I don't know what you're doing, but in the last three weeks, your child has just progressed six months worth of treatment that since, you know, since we have started. And the only difference was they added what you just said, us dealing with the underlying structure, us getting the system prime. You know, it's no different than anything else. If you have an injury, if you have a sports injury, right? Um, first it has to heal and then you can rehabilitate it. If you have a dislocated shoulder, you can't go in the next day and start rehabilitating it. It has to heal, and then you can rehabilitate it. So we have to heal the underlying structure, which is the nervous system, the dermal meningeal system, and then all that other stuff is so much more helpful and so much quicker. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, you were just a welcome <laughs> person. Um, I'm so thankful you took the time out today. For those of you who are just listening uh, to the audio, you can check out the video too and see some of the the examples that he's showing with the cranium because i think it's sometimes really important to visualize those things so go back and watch them but uh we just thank you so much uh dr rosen and for just what you've been doing in our profession for other even just chiropractors listening please go take some of their courses this is if if you want to or you do treat the pediatric population you need to know some of these skill sets to treat them properly uh so i know i'm very thankful uh, for you guys and what you're doing and what you continue to do. Um, other than your website, is there any other ways uh, people can find out more information about you guys? Sure. The best place to find out about our courses for chiropractors, professional courses, is go to peakpotentialprogram.com. And that has our online courses and our hands-on courses plus our books. So that's peakpotentialprogram.com. If you want to contact us, Go to um, Dr. Martin Rosen at gmail.com and the doctor is Dr. Martin Rosen at gmail. You can contact us there. Um, for those of you who are not professionals and want more information about you know chiropractic or our office, that is Wellesley, W E L L E S L E Y, Cairo, C H I R O dot com. And that those are places. And if you you know, interrelate to any one of those places and have a question, it all gets to us. So we will answer them whether you're a professional or a non-professional um, and need some help or have some questions. Those are the places that are easiest to contact us. Amazing. Well, thank you again so much for your time. Yeah. And for everyone listening, we will catch you on the next episode.